Okay, I think we're just having people join us now for our webinar. We'll give it a minute, just in case anyone's running a minute or so late to get started. For those of you that are here, we are delighted that you are joining us today. As you can see by my background, I am virtually on campus and delighted to be on SDCC campus. I miss it immensely and cannot wait to be back there in person. So I'm using it as my background so I can be on campus during the webinars. So welcome. We're really glad that you've joined us for today's webinar titled Ask Me Anything About IP, Ask Me Anything About Intellectual Property. I'm Diane Sabato, and I'm joined by uh, attorney Rick Kozakowski and Professor John Diffley. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to it in a follow-up email. And I will also include links to the first two webinars that we did, which were the top 10 things you need to know about intellectual property, as well as defending your intellectual property. We're aiming for an hour long. We're hoping that you've come with lots of questions to ask and that we will take up the entire hour, but we're gonna cover most common questions that are asked, questions that you have. And then I came with some questions that relate specifically to our students who are starting businesses. So uh, the agenda is that attorney Rick Kozakowski will give a quick overview of intellectual property and a little bit on defense with the link to the presentation. And then we're gonna basically spend this session open to your question. And again, I hope you've come with lots of them. We wanna be able to answer any and all, however big, however small. There really is no such thing as a bad question when it comes to IP. Uh, lots of people know that it exists and that they have to do something about it, but just don't really know where to begin or steps to take and those kinds of things. So we're happy to provide that. This is the third and final session in a three-part webinar series about intellectual property. It's part of STCC's IP Educator in Residence Program, which is a joint initiative of the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship and the Michelson Institute for Intellectual Property. I wanted to provide a little background on our panelists. Uh, John Diffley, who is joining us as a professor, a history professor, at STCC as well as the honors program coordinator and he is an attorney himself as well. I am a business professor. Uh, I just actually happily celebrated my 20 years at STCC and I have been in the entrepreneurship edu education field for the entire time. I teach in the business department and I'm also a small business owner. Rick Kozakowski is the founder and principal of Swiftwater Law. He's worked for over 30 years in the legal profession, as well as 10 years as a technician and engineer. He brings unique insights and business, legal, and technical skills to his work. He's worked with both startups and corporations and law firms that specialize in IP law. He's an STCC graduate who earned his subsequent degrees going to school at night while working full time. His professional career began as an electronics technician with Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Division of UTC. He was later named Chief IP Counsel for Pratt & Whitney, where he led the IP legal function for the whole company. Rick's been registered to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office, known as USPTO, since 1989. What this means is that he had to pass a rigorous exam specifically for this purpose in addition to the state bar exam. In order to even sit for that USPTO exam, candidates must have a science, technology, or engineering degree to sit for the exam. He's been admitted to practice as an attorney since 1990. In Rick's legal and technical career, he's worked with all kinds of businesses. His current focus is working with entrepreneurs and startup founders, and he volunteers as a mentor for entrepreneurs and startups with both the Valley Venture Mentors Program in Springfield and E for All Holyoke in, uh, Startup Accelerator Business Programs. Rick has volunteered his time to share his expertise with us today, which we are deeply grateful for. It's my great pleasure to now introduce Rick Kozakowski. Rick. Thanks, Diane, I appreciate the intro. <laughs> Uh, before I get started uh, and giving some brief intro introduction on intellectual property, I just I got to go through the standard disclaimer. 
for this presentation today. So anything that I talk about today, any information that I impart in this webinar is for general information purposes only and should not be construed or considered or interpreted as specific legal advice or counsel for your situation. Uh, also, there's no attorney client or confidential relationship that'll be formed between me and any members of the audience today. Uh, if you do have any specific legal issues or questions that uh, you wanna ask someone, uh, I suggest you seek advice from a competent counsel for your specific situation. So next slide, okay. So before we take some questions, I, I just wanna give a brief overview of intellectual property or IP. We've all heard the term. It's a very popular term right now, but it's really a, an umbrella term that covers the four specific and distinct aspects of intellectual property law. And those four are patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. And those four aspects, they have some significant differences uh, between them, primarily in how you know, the type of creations that are protected, how, those, how legal rights are obtained, how long those legal rights last, um, how, you know, what are the penalties for infringing those legal rights, um, things like that. So patents, they cover inventions or creations of the mind where you, you're improving upon a product, an existing product or a process, and you've built a better mousetrap, so to speak. So uh, you don't get any legal rights until you make a formal application to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which is located in Alexandria, Virginia. And your application for a patent will go through a rigorous examination process where basically your invention will be measured against the prior art that exists every, anywhere in the world to see if what you've come up with for an improvement really is novel uh, over the prior art. And if so, which, and if that process could take a year or two or even longer, it depends how much back and forth correspondence there is between you and the patent office. Those rights last for a total of 20 years from, but it's those 20 years are measured from the filing date of your patent application. And those you're given, federal rights, there are no state rights, state law rights, they're all under federal law. You're basically given the right to exclude anyone from commercializing your invention. Specifically, you, you're given the right to exclude people from making your invention, selling your invention, offering for sale your invention, using your invention, or importing it into the United States uh, for a period of time. And the United States patent is only good and enforceable in the United States. So if you want patent protection in other countries like China or the UK or whatever, you have to actually make application to those countries. In other words, there's no worldwide patent that exists. Um, and if there are, if you feel someone's infringing, it's strictly a civil action. It's not also or otherwise a, a criminal action. You can't call the FBI or whatever and say, hey, you know, someone's infringing my patent. You have to take steps to go after the infringer, you know, starting with, let's say, a cease and desist letter and, or worst case, you may have to file a lawsuit against them. So that's patents. Uh, next are trademarks. And trademarks really cover uh, words or logos or other types of things that you use in your business to identify or brand your business. So it could be a word mark, could be a design or a logo, it could be a sound, it could be a smell, uh, it could be other things. As long as those things identify your brand to the, to the public and they come to recognize that, hey, when they see a certain word or set of words or a certain logo, they know that there's a certain product that's being sold or certain services that are being provided under that brand. So with trademarks, they're governed primarily by federal law, although each state has its own laws as well, but you can think primarily that federal law governs. And the federal law says that 
once you start using your mark on goods that you provide in interstate commerce to somebody you sell them or you're providing services, let's say you have a restaurant or um, consulting services or accounting services or even legal services that you provide under your brand names or logo or whatever, then as soon as you start using the mark in commerce on those goods and services, you, you automatically create federal rights or rights under federal law. So you can keep people from using that same mark on similar goods or services. You can also take it a step beyond that and you can file an application to register your trademarks with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, if you get a registration to issue, which takes a lot shorter time period than usually what it takes for a patent. Typically, if, uh, if everything goes smoothly, it takes about eight months minimum to get a federal registration issue. But if you do get a federal registration for your trademark, you, you can then, you have a number of additional powerful federal rights that you can assert against someone who's infringing your trademarks. Uh, next up are copyrights and copyrights, the subject matter they protect are creations of the mind that are reduced to a tangible medium of expression. So it's, uh, it's a writing, let's say it's a book or a paper, uh, it could be artwork, uh, you know, some type of canvas painting or uh, something, it could be uh, photography, let's say you're a commercial photographer, you take pictures of something, let's say the sunset over Western Massachusetts, well, that's your creation, even though the idea itself of a sunset, let's say from the top of Skinner Mountain looking west, the idea itself is not copyrightable. But on the other hand, your photograph of that sun sunset is copyrightable. Uh, and copyrights are similar to trademarks in that as soon as you reduce the idea to a tangible medium of expression, in other words, you take the photograph, you build a website, you, you, know, you put content on a website, um, you do some art, you paint something, then you have rights under federal law to exclude people from making copies of it, from distributing copies, from displaying those copies of your work. Um, you can also, if you'd like, file for a registration with the United States Copyright Office, which is in downtown Washington, DC. Uh, it's a fairly quick procedure. It only takes a few weeks and it's fairly inexpensive. It's depending on the type of work that you created, it can be as low as I believe $35, $40 now for the application fee. Uh, the last area are, are trade secrets and those cover proprietary information or confidential information of, usually it's of a business and it provides that business with a competitive advantage. And that information it could also be information that rises to the level of something that could be patentable. Let's say it could be the formula for something like Coca-Cola. But usually it, it, it deals instead with valuable commercial information such as who are your customers and what are their buying tendencies? Who are your suppliers and what prices do they charge you? Uh, you know, other things, let's say if you have a, you have a factory, you have a machine shop, you may have proprietary machining processes that you use to machine parts that you sell to customers. So it could be those proprietary processes as well. The key which thing with trade secrets is you, you don't have to make a, any application to obtain legal rights to any kind of an office. As soon as you create this information and if it, you take steps to keep it as a secret to yourself, then you have rights. And trade secrets are governed primarily by state state law. Although there are some federal law rights as well, but it's, you look to Massachusetts law for, if it's, if you're based here in Massachusetts or Connecticut, every state has its own trade secret laws. And just about every state except New York models their laws under the federal trade secret acts. So, uh, so there is some uniformity between the states as to what's protected. 
And theoretically, those rights under trade secret, they can last forever as long as you take steps to keep it a secret. Again, Coca-Cola was created in 1886, the formula. They could have applied for a patent way back then, but the patent would have expired after, I mean, it was less than 20 years back then, but it, it would have expired in the early 1900s. Instead, the formula for Coca-Cola is still kept as a trade secret today. And it is such, the formula or recipe is such that nobody can, no one can reverse engineer and figure out what the formula is. There's something in the ingredients and there's something in the processing steps that people just can't figure out. So that's another thing to keep in mind. If you're deciding whether to keep something as a trade secret or maybe to get a patent on it, if you go the trade secret route, you have to make sure that if it's, let's say a tangible product that you put out in the marketplace, if a customer buys your product, will they be able to reverse engineer and figure out what your proprietary information or trade secrets are? If so, then you may want to instead look at getting a patent on it. Because even though a patent only has a finite lifespan, patents will cover technology. You know, These days, technology becomes obsolete very quickly. Uh, most technologies become obsolete within the 20 year protection period of a patent. So it's the rare technology that lasts beyond 20 years. Again, something like the formula for Coca-Cola. So, and with trade secrets, the penal, there are criminal penalties for theft. There are civil penalties as well. Um, you can bring, a, you know, have a criminal action brought against someone, let's say who, who misappropriates your trade secrets. A quick common scenario for that is, let's say you have a company and you have a valuable employee and that employee leaves and he or she goes to work for a competitor or they start their own company, which competes with you. You know, they, that person who leaves, they have the right to go work for someone else and make a living um, wherever they feel, wherever they please. But they are not allowed to use your specific proprietary information at their new employer to your disadvantage. If that's the case, and we see this all the time now in the news, the, you know, the former employer goes after and files suit against the new employer or the new company that the former employee starts. And they also bring, uh, seek criminal charges as well. Uh, if, you know, it, it becomes a problem to the former employee where, you know, they're, they could lose, they could lose their market share, they could lose products, they, they're, because they've lost valuable information that went out the door with the former employee. So, so in a nutshell, those are, those are the four areas of intellectual property. Uh, we touched, I touched on a lot of those in the earlier seminar, webinar that we did in February. And then in March, we did a second webinar in this series where I talked about a number of the different tools you can use to defend your intellectual property rights. I mentioned earlier, you know, a good way to start is to send the person or entity that you think is infringing your rights a, um, a cease and desist letter where you outline your rights to the infringing party and you say, here, here are my patent rights or here are my trademark rights and here's how you're infringing those rights and you know you need to stop because you're causing me business harm or harm to my business rather. So um, there's other things you can do. I mean, the worst case you file a lawsuit, but you know, the outcome of any lawsuit is never certain usually. And it takes a lot of money and time to, to file a lawsuit, but you know, there's lawsuits are filed all the time. There was just one filed by Nike against a rapper about three weeks ago who came out with his own line of sneakers that kind of borrowed from one of the Nike sneakers. So they immediately marched into federal court in New York and filed a lawsuit to, to get them to stop from, from doing that. So, okay. Questions? So we are now at the Q&A portion of the program. 
Um, I'm going to ask Professor Diffley to monitor the chat and the Q&A, and he'll pop in and ask questions that come up. So get your questions ready. And I want to kick it off. I have a, a burning question because I teach entrepreneurship, and I know you've been doing mentoring with a lot of startup businesses. And when students or others are starting a business, it can be really overwhelming. They're working on their business plan, all their market research, all the things that it takes to get the business planned and up and running. And when it comes to intellectual property, sadly, I think it's something that can be overlooked. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, where should they start? What's the best place for them to start with the greatest payoff? Is it to protect sort of their branding and their visual identity? Is that what, what should they do first when you know they have limited time, money, and resources? I think uh, the first thing to do is, is look at just what, what have they come up with? Is it, is it an invention? In other words, is it an improvement to a product, let's say, or a process have they come up with? And then look to see, okay, if it is an improvement, do a patent search to see if someone already has a patent on that because you don't you don't want to get too far down the road with your invention if someone already has it covered with a patent so patent searches are easy to do you can do them yourselves online using google patents or freepatentsonline.com or even at the uspto.gov website i think to make sure or to get a good sense that you can use the technology that you've improved you got to look to see if there are any patents out there. I think that's one of the first things you should do. Secondly, if you're thinking about starting a company around your product, and even if the product is not something that could be patentable, let's just say it's a business where you're, it's a food truck business or something like that. That's where branding is key. So, you want to pick a name, obviously, for your business, a word mark, a trademark, or a logo, or a design, or a combination that sets you apart from your competition, especially if it's food trucks. Food trucks are big now. Everybody's getting into it, the business seemingly. So you need a way for your, for your business to stick out amongst all the other food trucks that you're competing with. The way to do that is with your trademarks, your word mark, logo, whatever. But again, before you spend money on, on let's say wrapping your food truck, you know, wraps are expensive, two, three, four thousand $4,000 to get a food truck wrap. And, you know, other marketing materials, your website, you want to, you want to check and make sure no one else has the identical or similar trademark, be it a word mark or logo or design for use on the same goods or services. Because the rule under trademark law is when somebody picks a trademark and starts using it on goods or services that are provided in interstate commerce, that first user has the rights in that mark for those goods or services. And he or she can prevent someone who comes later in time from using the same or similar mark for the same or similar services. And the reason is because it could cause a likelihood of confusion amongst the consuming public. In other words, if they're, you know, you're at a food truck festival, let's say at MGM or somewhere else, and there's a cup, you know, there's one food truck that sells a certain type of sandwich, let's say, or pizza, whatever, and you have your food truck, it sells similar type foods, sandwiches or whatever, and now the, the trademarks are similar, now people, the public who's there are going to look and say, well, is this truck that's down here, they just, they're a newcomer. Are they affiliated with the truck that's been here for years? So what do we have there? We have a likelihood of confusion. And if the first user gets wind of, of you coming along secondly in time with a similar logo or word mark, then they're going to take steps to stop you. They're going to send you a cease and desist letter or they're going to say, hey, you can't do this. So what I'm getting at is before you spend money and time and effort mm -hmm. on promoting your brand, using your trademarks, be sure to do a search. And you can, again, you can do the search yourself. The same website, uspto.gov, which is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, 
go on to the trademark side of it there and they have a very good search tool where you can plug in a word or two and see if someone has a similar active federal trademark registration or maybe they have a pending application for registration that could pose a problem for you if you were to choose a similar mark for similar goods or services. So that's doing your due diligence, basically, your research before you get rolling. And I like the idea before you get too far down the, the exactly. process of developing your business, because you can invest a lot and then find out, oops, someone already yeah. used this name or logo, correct? Yeah, there's a, there's a quick, there's a quickly, it is a good example of that with Iron Duke Brewery in Ludlow. Oh, wow. Yep. They, they picked their name and I'm not associated, I don't do any work for them. Uh, I'm not associated with them, but their situation has been in the news over the last three or four years. They, they went into business around 2014. They picked Iron Duke. Uh, it's, it's kind of the coin name of an old engine that GM used to have way back in the seventies. For It's also the name of their dog. Is that, yeah. That's where it came from is Duke is there, uh, was that yeah, okay. the couple's dog. Right. Nick Morn. Yeah. The, the owner there, he's got a, he's got a great business there, but about, I think in 2017, he got a cease and desist letter from Duke university who <laughs> complained that, you know, they had some trademark registrations uh, for Duke, uh, for use on, I think one was, had to do with sporting events and stuff. And, you know, Duke University obviously have deep pockets. They can spend money on lawyers and they didn't file a lawsuit from what I understand, but they sent uh, Iron Duke and Ludlow a cease and desist letter. And I guess they reached an agreement last year where Iron Duke was going to change their name. They haven't done so yet. Because uh, I was just looking at their Facebook page over the weekend. Because uh, I like, actually I like going there. They, they're, it's, it's a nice spot to, uh, to grab a beer and some food. But um, so that's an ex that's a great example, Diane. Of mm -hmm. you know you got to make sure as best as you can. Now you know again Duke University has deep pockets. Maybe they were stretching things a bit here as the owner of a superior trademark, but. They, you know, Duke, Duke could have litigated Iron Duke to death. Duke University could have. And so I guess they, according to what I read last year on Business West or Mass Live, I guess Iron Duke has agreed to change something to appease Duke to avoid this confusion or likelihood of confusion in the marketplace. So. Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we actually had a question in the chat here. Um, so uh, Dan Misko asked, so say you do a search extensively as you can, document your methodology and everything, but you still miss something um, and it's sort of accidental infringement. Uh, well, you know, keeping records of your searches, does that help you? Or when you infringe, you've infringed? I mean, is there any- you, Yeah, when you, when you infringe, you infringe. I mean, if if you miss something, then that's bad on you. You know, it's it's- there, there are some really good search tools. Uh, there are companies that'll do it that are that are inexpensive. Uh, they're web, you know, they're they're on the internet. You can contract with them to do a search for you, um, and they'll they'll do a pretty good search. I mean, they could yes, they could still miss something because when it comes to trademarks, you're not only looking for active registrations in the United States or um, in the United States, or if you plan on marketing your goods or services outside the United States, then let's say if it's in Canada, you want to do a trademark search in Canada as well. But not only could active issued registrations be a problem for you and pending applications for registration, because those pending applications will cover a usage of a mark that's before your proposed or intended usage of a mark. You also have to look at common law usages. You know, let's say you have a business here in New England, you sell goods over the internet on Amazon, and you know, maybe you're selling them locally. Now you wanna get on Amazon and you wanna now crisscross the entire, cover the entire country. But what if somebody in Southern California has been using the same mark for the same goods you know, prior to your use 
adoption and use of your mark here in New England. Well, if you want to now sell your goods into Southern California, you could run into a problem because this prior user, even though he or she doesn't have a registration or they've not applied for a federal registration, and maybe they don't even have a California state trade registration, nonetheless, they have common law rights, as I mentioned earlier, under trademark law, federal trademark law, once you start using a mark on goods or services, you have rights to keep people from coming into your geographic area and selling the same goods or services. So it's important when you do a search or have somebody do the search that they check common law usages as well. And there are databases that these searching companies will access and they'll, they'll usually say to you, hey, Rick, uh, you know, you have your client wants to go, if they wanna do nationwide selling or marketing of their goods or services, I wanna let you know that there's somebody in Arizona or there's somebody in Seattle area or the Midwest who has, who's been using a similar mark for similar goods or services, and it could be a problem for you. So then you gotta make a decision, well, okay, should I not expand across the country or, if I do want to expand, maybe I need to pick a different mark, which can be cleared throughout the country for my use. So, and usually, you know, obviously if you have intentions to sell your products or provide your services throughout the country, you really want to pick a mark that's available for you to use throughout the entire country. So. Uh, Rick, so say you use one of those companies and do a search, what happens if they mess up? Who's liable? Do they I offer they any insurance are. for this? Yeah, there is. They I think they are. Them. They are. They are liable. They should. You know, these reputable companies. Well, those that are reputable. I mean, I'm, some may not be, but you know, there's a lot of that have been around for a long time. Thompson, CompuMark, uh, and others, uh, Core Search. You know, I'm sure they have liability insurance that would cover them in case they make a mistake, but. You know, you may pay, pay a little more money for the search, but it's well worth it because they're going to they're going to do a really good job for you. But, you know, as with anything, mistakes do happen. So if someone does make a mistake, then, you know, they would be held. They could be held liable. So I had a question with uh, when um, <clears throat> you, you're supposed you can't. You're supposed to keep your trade, your uh, patent idea somewhat secret, right, before you file it. So, but how do you get investors then? I mean, what can you share with them when you're trying to bring in investors? I mean, how much of them, yeah, what would you do with that there to get people on board, but, you know, not give away your, your entire idea? What protections are there for you? What would you suggest? The, be the best thing to use um, prior to really getting a patent issue, so even, even if you file the patent application, and before it gets published, because the United States patent applications get published 18 months after the filing date that you file it with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So once it gets published, you know, the secret's out, out the window, you know, whatever's in the patent application. So what you should do is even before you file an application or after and before a patent application gets published, use a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement. And it's a contract where you as the owner of the invention, the information about it, the proprietary information that talks about it, how it's developed, you know, how it works, what the structure of it is, how it functions. You want to, but you want to talk to investors to see if they're interested. You want to talk to prototype shops to help you build a prototype. You want to talk to other people get them to sign a non-disclosure agreement. It's a simple contract. It just says that I own the proprietary information. You're interested in hearing about it for the limited purpose of maybe investing in my company, building me a prototype or doing some other service for me. And I, I as the owner of that proprietary info, I'll disclose it to you under these conditions, you can only use it to decide whether you want to invest in my company, or you can only use it to build a prototype for me or something like that. 
and you can't disclose it to anyone else. Um, you know, you can only use it for that purpose. And it's just, you know, there's plenty of non-disclosure agreements on the internet. You know, you can borrow a template from there or, you know, hire a lawyer, an IP attorney, patent attorney, they can put it together for you. It's, it's fairly inexpensive. Um, so that that's probably the best way to do it. And with any documents that you have, even if they're electronic, uh, you want to make sure you stamp stamp the documents confidential or proprietary, put your name on it and the name of your company. If you have an LLC or something, just you got to make sure that if somebody sees that information, even though they've not signed an NDA with you, that they know it's proprietary to you and that, you know, there's something important here to you as the owner of that information. So I would, you know, I would use the confidential or proprietary stamp on all the documents. Uh, and also think about, you know, let's say you're anxious to build a website to promote your product or your business. But, you know, once you put stuff up on a website, you can't realistically ask someone, you know, to keep it confidential because once you put it up there, the whole world can see it. So, you know, the secret's out the window at that point. So you gotta think through, is it beneficial to me to put up this information on my website so the, so the public can see it? Because if I don't have a patent in place by then, you know, maybe it's, it's I risk losing my, trade secret status of that information if if you were keeping it as a trade secret, which you can do prior to a patent issuing. Um, so those are the simple, quick, easy things you can do to protect. I have a kind of a follow-up question to that. If you are choosing between trade secret protection or patent protection, is one a better deterrent than the other based on the type of law that governs it? Are people more worried about being arrested under criminal law for violating a trade secret and stealing your idea or a patent because it seems like it's so important that it comes through the USPTO and the government? Yeah, it, it's, um, I think it depends on the technology, but uh, trade secrets cover a much broader scope of information than patents cover. Patents only cover certain improvements to products or processes that relates to articles of manufacture, machines, compositions of matter or processes. And if you get a patent to issue, again, like I said earlier, there are no criminal penalties. It's strictly civil. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of time, effort and money to sue somebody for patent infringement. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying patents, patents are not worth the effort they are because they act as a deterrent to people from copying your your idea your invention uh you know the the purpose of the patent is to when it issues to have the public read it look at the technology that's disclosed there and then improve upon it so they can advance the the knowledge base of technology to the entire world um, but you know there's always going to be people who are going to say, well, let's just copy Rick's patent and let's hope he doesn't sue us. And, you know, that happens. On the other hand, trade secrets, it has the possibility of being found criminally liable, which I think is powerful. So, sorry, you're not done, but I was God, curious well, how, how you document that to protect it under trade secret, which is important. Yeah, well, you have to, you know, one or the primary underpinnings of trade secret laws, you have to take steps to protect the information as secret. But to be able to do that, you have to identify what that information is. So you really have to look at, you know, as you're starting a business, what is it that is really important to me that I want to keep proprietary here? Is it some technical information about the product itself? Is it information about a process used to make products that, you know, once the product, once I sell the product, people are going to figure out how to build the product. But to me, what's valuable is the process for making the product. So is it that? Is it 
then it's this general business type info that's not protected by patents. And what I, I mentioned some examples earlier, like it's, it's who, you're, who are your customers? What are their buying tendencies throughout the year? Are they more active in the winter months than the summer? Are they more active around Christmas time, let's say, or Halloween because of the type of product you sell? Who are your suppliers? You know, what pricing do they, do they charge you when you buy goods and, and stuff from your suppliers? And just other things like that, um, that's important to you as a business. If you lost that information, if it became public to other companies, your competitors, then you're gonna lose, you could potentially lose sales of your products or services. So what I'm getting is trade secrets cover a much wider swath of information than patents cover. And because trade secret information starts immediately once you identify information, versus having to go through the time consuming process of getting a patent that's beneficial to the trade secret owner. And then the specter of someone being found criminally liable, if they left your employee and they go work for your competitor down the street or across the country, you know, they're, you know, why would a competitor want to hire your employee? Well, they want to hire him or her because they figure, well, he's worked for Rick for 10 years. Now he wants to go work for Diane, you know, out in the West Coast. Rick's going to be able to bring some valuable information to us. But again, you know, the new the employee has to be careful not to use my information as he's working for you, Diane. And, uh, you know, conversely, you have to be careful not to coax that information out of the employee that, he or she knows about my business that you're not entitled to use because it's problematic. I can go after not only the my former employee, but I can go after you for using my trade secrets to my detriment. So, so what if I was the employee who created the process while working for you? And then well, I that became the company. So the, who owns that? Well, most of the most of the time, and this has happened for years, this happened at United Technologies 40 years ago. Um, most companies, when you get hired there, as part of the employment agreement, even if you're an at-will employee, like most of us are, um, you're gonna, there's gonna be some uh, employee terms and conditions or what it'll be up on the company website or you may have to sign an explicit contract i know united technologies used to do that for every single employee i don't know if they still do that but they did it 30 years ago i know because i helped draft re revise the agreement but it basically says that okay you're going to come john you're going to come work for stick and as part of your employment at stick if you conceive of any kind of an improvement to anything that relates to anything that we do here at stick then you promise to assign all your ownership rights in that improvement over to us at here at stick and we're going to own it so and that's all right so stick obviously an educational institute but let's let's say we're at pratt whitney where i was 20 years ago anybody who comes into pratt whitney and they invent an improvement to a turbine jet engine blade or something else related to a jet engine. They've signed that agreement. And by the way, companies like Pratt & Whitney, if you don't sign that agreement, they're not going to hire you. That's an integral mm -hmm. and important part of the hiring of you into the company. So anyway, as part of your job, you, you in, invent something that relates to Pratt & Whitney's business. Well, you sign the agreement. Pratt Winnie, even though it's like five years after you started working for them, nevertheless, you signed that agreement on day one. It took effect. So now you invent something. Pratt Winnie owns it. You're the inventor normally, or but for you signing that agreement when you started at Pratt Winnie, you would own it, but you don't because you promised to assign your rights via contract to Pratt Winnie. Mm -hmm. So Pratt Winnie owns it. They can do with it what they wish. 
But now that the issue comes in, I've seen this happen a lot. What if you, as the employee, you invent something that has nothing to do with the products of the company? And we had this about 25 years ago at Hamilton Standard. An employee invented an improvement to a windsurfer. Well, Hamilton Standard and no other part of United Technologies at the time dealt with windsurfers. But that employee agreement said that that person still had to notify us in legal and ask for a waiver to release ownership back to him so he could pursue the windsurfer on his own and on his own time without any resources of Hamilton Standard. So. That was a question I was going to ask is, you know, say you're, you, you work there, uh, but you're moonlighting doing something. Uh, what do you do? Oh, hi, someone broke in. I told you he was going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, so oh, you have to make sure that you're not using company time, right? You're doing your moonlighting on the side, doing uh, your research. You have to be very careful about. That. So would you even like, uh, when you say not their time, what if you have a laptop, say, that you take home from you, with the company? Don't use that for your um, use that. stuff. I mean, how, you're right. It goes that that much. Any of their equipment, any of their resources. Exactly. Would you? Yeah. Right. Because right. you, if you, let's say you thought about it at home on a weekend, you had an aha moment and you said, hey, I, you know, I, I've been dealing with this issue at home here, something in my house or my boat or motorcycle or something. And I solved the problem with my boat. So, you know, I invented something. I, hey, I think I can make some money off of this. I'm gonna try to get a patent, whatever. That's great. You may think you're free and clear, but you gotta look at what you signed or you may not have signed a specific contract that has the title on it, intellectual property agreement, but you may, you probably signed something coming in the door that said, basically, I agree to be bound by all the employee terms and conditions of, you know, Acme widgets or the company you go to work for. All right, but then how do you find those terms and conditions? You go to their website, maybe it's an intranet only available to employees. And you look and you see, wow, look at all these terms and conditions. It says that if I think of anything, even if it has no relation to the business or products of Acme widgets, I still got to notify them that I invented something that's unrelated to my employer. So I, and I've seen that happen where, you know, they say anything you invent, even if it's at home, even if it has nothing to do with our company's products, you still have to let us know about it. So that's a great lesson in read before you sign any kind of contract or legal document. And we don't even think about it when we're installing things on computers and we're agreeing to all these conditions without reading them. It's amazing what you might be signing. It, it sure is. Um, and you know, I can understand as the entrepreneur, you feel, okay, you know, I've worked for Mass Mutual or whatever for 15 years, you know, I do insurance stuff for them. I just invented, you know, a new, I don't know, noise suppressor for my motorcycle. It has nothing to do with mass mutual. I really should own it. But you got to look at what you're obligated via contract to mass mutual or, you know, to whoever Yankee Candle, whoever your employer is. Because the last thing you want to do is invent something. And in your mind, you think you're good, you're free and clear. And then you, you, start in on developing it you know you spend money you know you're moonlighting you rent uh, some shop space you hire someone to build a prototype and now you it's like well i'm going to start selling these things and now you start selling them uh, on the internet on amazon and one of your fellow employees gets wind of it and they say hey joe you know i see you're selling these uh fancy things for motorcycles are you really supposed to do that? You know, and did you let management here know you're supposed to do that? And then, you know, then you're at the mercy of your company, whether they, you know, they're going to let you do this or not. So, so they, so they, they may, uh, sorry. yeah, they may, they may let you do it, but you know, you may have to go through a hassle. So the point I'm trying to make is just be upfront, look at what you're signing, 
you may and you may it may be non-negotiable when you're at day one you're coming into a company if that's what they put in front of you to sign you can say hey i don't like you know section eight the second sentence where it says you own everything that i invent but you may have no choice they may say either sign it or you're not working for us mm -hmm. so so like, uh, one thing I'm thinking here is uh, the companies you name, like work for, they're all pretty big companies. What if you own a small business and you have employees? So uh, what I'm hearing is almost that you should have something like a forum. Uh, to, so, so I'm thinking like a, I own a landscaping company and, you know, my employee figures out a better way to do something, but I should still have that protection in there, even if it's a, a smaller business. Cause, I, and, and how would you do that? Because you, you most likely don't have a legal department there to to draft something like that just can you find something like that or is it just it's boilerplate language sort of well i i would uh i would get in touch with a, a business attorney i i'm guessing you probably hired a business attorney to help help your business get off the ground and you know, you know it you know someone who works at a local law firm or something maybe you know maybe you have a cousin or something who's an attorney who helped you form the LLC and stuff. Um, you know, I think you, you want to get some advice there. Uh, it, it, but you're right. It's a concern. You're, you're starting a business, you know, let's, you know, let's say you don't, you can't afford an office. So you, you co co-work some space at VVM's offices on Bridge Street in Springfield. And now you want to bring on an employee to help you out to do graphic design or do software coding or something, you want to make sure if that someone, you know, anything he or she creates, whether it's patentable, uh, if it's software, it could be copyrightable, you know, so you get that gets into work for hire issues. You want to try to cover that. So if you're going to hire this person, him or her, he or she, you know, have some kind of an agreement in place. I mean, the the internet is wonderful for boilerplate agreements for anything mm -hmm. legal. I mean, you know, you can try to do it yourself, lawyer, or, you know, go to legal zoom, uh, get something there or, you know, just call a local lawyer. I mean, it's, you know, there for a simple agreement like that, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna break the bank for you. Mm -hmm. And it's well, I think it's well worth it because it will protect you from again, if you hire somebody, and even if it's a freelancer, you hire him or her through Fiverr, you know, a gig worker, you still want to make sure you lock up what they create for you. So I have a question related to that, because there are a lot of services out there for startups to create logos and all their branding materials, everything from Fiverr to 99designs to all kinds of gig workers out there. What should startup business owners do to ensure that what they're getting, number one, is in fact original? Uh, that it wasn't copied from somewhere else, that it's not a generic logo that's already out there, which happens quite a bit when you go on some yep. of these services. What exactly should they look out for when they're using a logo branding creation service? Right. All right. If it has to do with a logo, I would say you're hiring this person or entity to create it for you because you don't have the time or resources mm -hmm. to do it. So you're trusting that this person a gig worker, let's say, or this digital marketing agency, when they come up with a logo, that they're not copying it mm -hmm. from something, someone who may have trademark rights in it or copyright rights in it. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to have a deal or, you know, a small purchase and sale agreement in place with this worker to create this for you. There should be some legal language in there a representation and warranty that says that this digital marketing agency, you know, whatever they create for you is going to be original for you. And as best as they know, you know, and they know from doing a search or, you know, an internet search or trademark search, as best as they know, they represent warrant to you that you're hiring them, that what they create for you, no one else has right. No third party has rights in that logo so that you can use it. Now, when you're talking about trademarks and copyrights, you know, their logos are ubiquitous. You know, someone could have a logo in Europe that they unintentionally, the person you hire copies that logo. 
And maybe that someone with a logo wants to eventually come from Europe here. So now you're, you know, you're getting into problems here, but the best way when you're hiring someone like that is to have them in writing, make a warranty to you that to the best of their knowledge, they did searching and whatever, and they, whatever they create for you, you will own as the hiring party that it's free and clear. And you should have signed agreements saying, I forfeit as a designer, all any rights that, you know, to you and you right. are the owner. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. the second thing. You're great, you know, for copyrights, the general rule under law is whoever creates that work, you know, be it artwork or logo or design, mm -hmm. it's the creator that owns the rights in it. Well, the big exception to that is what's called the work for hire. And so that when you, you, hire someone to do work for you and that person in within the scope of that work that they're doing for you they create the logo then the work for hire doctrine under copyright law says that you the hiring party you own all rights in that logo or design not the person who created it for you but it's always good to just memorialize it in writing and you know you have an agreement a purchase and sale agreement or whatever you want to call it, some simple contract with this creative agency, marketing agency, that'll say, hey, whatever you create for me, I own it. Mm -hmm. So And have full rights too. Yeah, we did a webinar. Have full rights to, yeah. to under copyrights, you know, to reproduce it, to distribute it. You, you have assigned all rights over in this, under yeah. trademarks, under copyrights, mm -hmm. whatever, it's mine. So... Perfect. So we are actually coming up on our hour long time. It's 1.59 and I do want to be respectful of people's time, both the panelists, the attendees and everybody else. So I want to make sure that everyone on the call and the audience that might be viewing this later on through an email or a link that you know that the recordings of the webinar series are available on STCC's YouTube channel, and not just our recordings on the IP series, but there are a number of fantastic uh, recordings there for all the things that have been happening at STCC throughout the pandemic. Particularly, we've had a lot of great events that have been captured, so that's awesome. But these are the three, as I mentioned, top 10 things to know about IP, defending your intellectual property, and this recording will be available there as well. Our contact information is here. If you have any follow-up questions or anything that you want to uh, talk to us about, there's Rick's information for his practice to get in touch with him. Professor, D D Blah, Professor Diffley and myself is our email at STCC. The Michelson Institute for Intellectual Property, they provide an amazing array of open source educational resources for educators, for just anyone that wants to know about IP. And then the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship, which was very proudly established at STCC, and it's now a national influencer in entrepreneurship education at the community college level. And they're partnering with Michelson for this whole IP initiative. And then John, I'm gonna ask you real quick, what's coming up next week, World IP Day, if you have the details on that. Yeah, so World IP Day is Monday coming up. There's going to be events. Michelson's going to have a bunch. Um, we can uh, send those out. I unfortunately don't have them in front of me, but they're going to be doing yeah. um, uh, webinars like this and uh, <clears throat> uh, other stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll actually uh, hopefully send out some information before then as well. So, yeah, yeah. Great. So it's a worldwide celebration of intellectual property and all things related. You can find the information on their website. I know that Macy's promoting it as well, and you're going to see some uh, marketing on that. I want to take a minute to thank Rick again, because this has been amazing, this whole webinar series, and he recruited another attorney for our last session, which was fantastic. And we're hoping that we can continue to partner through our future initiatives and offerings related to intellectual property. Again, thank you, Rick. Thank you, John. Thanks, Keith, for putting this all together. And uh, we hope to see you in the next round. Take care, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Diane and John. Thanks for inviting me, and I've, I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you so awesome. much, Rick. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Okay, Keith, you can stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>